the biggest moment in rap in over a decade just happened. I literally cover beefs on this channel and that's it. So th this is like Christmas for me. If anyone has been following this channel, you probably saw my coverage of Drake and Kendrick's long running beef as it is the biggest video on the internet regarding that topic. This subliminal shit's been going on for a very long time. Just one month ago, I told you guys that Kendrick was coming with some shots and you clowned me. Like I said, I mean, like I'll put my entire YouTube channel on the line here. Like Kendrick will have a response to these records. And then this happened. Mother the big three, nigga, it's just big me, nigga, boom. And I've also been telling you guys that counting Drake out of this thing is a huge mistake. If you're gonna sit there and count Drake out entirely, like he has zero chance, that just tells me that you really haven't been paying attention. Drake just dropped an atomic bomb, and this will be my most exciting breakdown that I've ever done on this channel. I could barely keep it together, I'm not gonna lie. So right off rip, I wanted to point something out about the original track that we got, which was the on mix version, where Drake started out the record with a big sigh. <sighs> now this sigh was very similar to how he started off the Duppy freestyle against Pusha T. <sighs> so Drake is basically acting as if this is a huge inconvenience. Now, this did get removed from the final version, and I'm not sure why he removed it, but it could be based on superstition, because we all know how the Duppy freestyle played out. You are hiding a child, man. On the final version of the track, the record does not start out with a sigh, but instead the iconic Woo Kid drop. Now, I'm not convinced for one second that Who Kid had much to do with the actual production of this record, and I feel that it is the drop in itself where Drake is sending the message. We're talking about a man that was along for the ride with the pettiest rapper to ever live, hosting some of the most iconic tapes that were full of diss records. Drake is setting the tone for this war. Hey, young Metro, no, trust you, I'm gonna shoot you. There's no question about it that the drop is symbolic. Like, he's bringing us back to this era, like a very exciting era, the mixtape era, while giving us this moment himself. Another thing I wanted to point out about the leak is if you listen closely, you can hear that Drake samples Biggie's Get Money. I could never be nobody number one fan. If now, there is some more intended symbolism behind the choice of this sample. Biggie's Get Money is essentially a story about a woman that he cheats on who becomes scorned and turns against him. Now, this is going to make a lot more sense to you guys a little later in this video, but keep in mind when Future said this to Drake. And I also found a very similar line from a Rick Ross and Meek Mill track, and that track is only four months old. So place a bomb bet, you haven't won yet, never. We thick on our corners, uh, come and get a small bonus. Get it. This what you call moments, pillow talking and forming. Looking back at this now, I do feel like this was indeed a subliminal towards Drake that we just didn't catch. Drake is a massive gambling guy, and Ross references placing bets and collecting a bonus. He then echoes a very similar line to Future, calling Drake a pillow talking informant. Stay with me. Drake starts off the record by responding directly to Future Shot on a track that was released on March 22nd called We Don't Trust You. A nigga number one fan, dog. Sneak, it's an on, understand, dog. It was on that track where Future claimed that Drake was his number one fan, and Drake decided to clear that rumor up. I could never be nobody number one fan. Your first number one, I had to put it in your hand. Drake stunts on Future by claiming that he could never be his number one fan pointing out how he was the first person to give him a number one record, and that record was way too sexy. I'm too sexy for this sir. And as this thing progresses and we get more diss tracks, we can expect more of the same from Drake, as he pretty much helped all these guys early on in their careers. I did see a post on Twitter from Hip Hop by Numbers, and they did the analytics to show that Drake has helped 32 artists to get their highest rank on the Hot 100 charts, 
at the time. So when it comes to that shit, like Drake has a very obvious angle that he, that he could play. Drake then points out that he's a global phenom and that these guys couldn't do numbers outside of America. You pussies can't get booked outside America for now. I'm out in Tokyo because I'm big in Japan. So we already know that the first line could not be directed at Kendrick because he is very much a global artist. When it comes to future, he has done some traveling, but outside of a few shows, he exclusively plays at music festivals, whereas someone like Drake sells out entire standalone shows. There's just a massive difference in being able to pack out an arena in Germany where your name is the draw, like your name is on the flyer, that's it, and, you know, playing a music festival in Belgium somewhere with, you know, 100 people on the lineup. Now, this Tokyo line might seem simple, but it has a lot of depth, and it might just be the direct cause of the tension between Drake and Future. This is a girl that goes by the name of Just Tokyo on Instagram. Now, stay with me because I'm about to blow the fucking lid off this thing. 28 weeks ago, this woman is at Drake's It's a Blur tour in Miami. Here she is posting a video of Drake performing, and here she is next to one of the trailers. Now, I can't be sure, but I do see this woman as someone that Drake invited to the show, and he probably did that for a pretty good reason. However, just a few months later, she posted a series of videos for her birthday with the caption, Thank you to my Freebands fam for another celebration. For those that don't know, Freebands is Future's record label. And just a few months later, she's front and center at Future's Rolling Loud show. Here she is next to another trailer, and here she is backstage with the We Don't Trust You t-shirt, where she included the caption, Enough Said, with the date that the album dropped. What's even more interesting is that this woman has been linked to Future for years now. Here's a photo from 2021. So when Drake says, I'm out in Tokyo, I'm big in Japan, just, just think about it. The girl is Japanese. I'm the only Japanese in the family. He's saying he fucked her, like, you know, he's big in Japan, he, he gave her the hammer. Outside of that, this line wouldn't make any sense. Statistically speaking, Drake is not big in Japan. Japan is actually one of Drake's weakest markets. Now, in the case of Kendrick, he performed in Tokyo in 2023 and had the crowd singing his lyrics word for word. And I really started to realize just how big Kendrick was in places like China when a guy hit me up a few weeks ago and he asked permission to translate my Kendrick and Cole video so that he could post it on a Chinese website. And I told the guy to just go ahead and post it, like spread the love of hip hop. And I couldn't fucking believe it. He hit me back after and told me that the video is just going crazy in China right now, which blew my mind. Drake then goes on to point out that he's the hit maker that all these guys rely on. I'm the hit maker, y'all depend on. Backstage in my city, it was friends on. Drake has been feuding with a lot of rappers as of late, so this could be directed towards multiple people. In the case of Rick Ross, he reached out to Drake back in 2010 to help with his album, and that's when we got Aston Martin Music. I just needed time. That track was a single on Rick Ross's Teflon Don album and was indeed the biggest single on the album. Call Drake. Call my homie Drake. Shout out to Drizzy Drake. And due to the success of that record, Ross recruited Drake again for his next album, where he chose to promote the project with a Drake feature. I'm in the condo just posted watching Miami kill. Now the track didn't make it on the album, but he did he did use Drake as like a promotional tool. However, Drake would make it onto the album as he again gave Ross one of his biggest singles, Dice Pineapples. That track is now a certified platinum record, and Drake would carry on to give Ross more big records like Stay Scheming and Gold Rose. Drake is on quite a few of his biggest records, so this definitely could pertain to Ross. But this line pertains even more so to Future, as out of his eight most successful records, Drake's name is on five of them. Personally, my favorite song that they ever did was Scholarships, but, I mean, they got a lot of bangers. Now, as far as the line, Backstage in My City, it was Friend Zone, this could be pertaining to one of three people. Rick Ross was in Toronto on October 9th, 2019. 
Future was in Toronto for Rolling Loud on September 9th, 2022, and Kendrick was in Toronto August 12th and the 13th of 2022, and Drake did show up to that show. There was video of Drake watching from a skybox at the Scotiabank Arena. And but Drake showing up to the concert is just a, a chess move. You won't never take no chain off of us. How the fuck you be stepping with a size seven man zone? In the first line, Drake responds directly to Kendrick's threat on Like That when he said that he would snatch his chain. Got two T's with me. I'm snatching chains and burning tattoos. It's up. Drake then continues to play on Kendrick's album title, Mr. Morell and the Big Steppers, and points out how he can't be a big stepper when he's only 5'5". Five five. It's a great little punchline. I mean, he's, he's adding a little bit of humor into the mix, and that's, that's just all part of battling. Drake then makes it clear that he's ready for war, and he's diving headfirst into this thing. This the part with the bite, nigga, what's up? I know my picture on the wall when y'all cook up. In the second line, Drake references that his picture is on the wall when they cook up, meaning that their hatred and jealousy towards him is the only inspiration that they have to even go into the studio. Again, I've said this about Drake before, like a line like this just got hove written all over it. Like this is what Jay-Z used to do. He's going to little bro you, he's going to flex on you, he's going to stun on you. That's hove. Extortion, baby, hope for red, you been shook up. This top so you drop and give me 50 likes of push-ups. Cool. This line actually has a few meanings. Drake calls Kendrick an extortion baby, alluding to how Anthony Top Dog, the owner of TDE, has forced him into a shitty deal. Extortion is a tactic that is synonymous with gang culture, and Drake uses it here to reference Top Dog's ties to the Bloods. This was actually something that J. Cole spoke about very early on. Niggas like, yo, yeah, he fuck with some dude named Top Dog. I'm like, who the fuck is a Top Dog? Yeah, he, he, need to he probably it. gonna fuck up his career. Some hood nigga that got this nigga <laughs> locked up. Like Drake then mentions that Top Dog tells Kendrick to drop and give him 50, alluding to how Kendrick is like a little soldier and Top Dog is the sergeant, a.k.a. the boss. Drake then continues on by mocking Kendrick's ad lib from his track Silent Hill. But the line only gets deeper as Kendrick allegedly had to split 50% of his profits with TDE. And lastly, Drake references push-ups in a literal sense where there's actual footage of Kendrick doing push-ups. That line's fire. Yo, last one brick, you really not on shit. They make excuses for you because they hate to see me lit. So pretty self-explanatory, Drake brings up the fact that the album that Kendrick dropped, which took five years to get, wasn't received very well and is often referred to as a flop. Pull your contract because we got to see the split. The way you doing splits, bitch, your pants might rip. All right, so this line is fucking crazy and everyone is missing it. First and foremost, when Drake refers to the contract and the split, he's referring to Kendrick's former TDE contract, where it's alleged that 50% went to TDE. And that is the only part of the line that people are hearing. But Drake is not just talking about the old TDE contract. Drake wants to see what Kendrick had to agree to in order to leave TDE when the split from the label happened. So again, he's playing into the whole extortion line, right? Like, what did you do to leave? Like, what did you have to agree to? I know these guys are still in your pockets. But this line is even deeper than that. You need to pay attention to when Drake says the way you're doing splits. Splits meaning not just the profit sharing split and not just the split from TDE itself, but another split entirely. Kendrick addresses cheating on his wife throughout his entire last album. While after some therapy, he is still with his wife today, it seems very likely that they did split at some point. By saying your pants might rip, Drake is poking at his rocky relationship in the sense that if a divorce happens, you will literally be split in two. Your pants might rip. Kendrick's wife will take half of everything he owns, just like his former label did. And all this shit is just going over heads. Like, that line is fucking crazy, guys. 
Like crazy. You better do that motherfucking show inside the bitty. Maroon 5 need a verse, you better make it witty. Then we need a verse for the Swifties. Top say drop, you better drop and give them 50. Drake plays directly into his previous extortion line by saying you better do the show inside the bitty, insinuating that gang members are calling the shots and that Kendrick is powerless to their demands. You know how to blood swap out the C's for the B's like Big Bull and Brack and a Brazy, sitting back eating a bocklet bit bookie. Drake continues to support his claims of Kendrick being a worker by bringing up his collaborations with Maroon 5 and Taylor Swift. Kendrick is very much a conscious rapper and something tells me that Drake had some inside information that maybe he wasn't thrilled about doing these records but didn't have any choice in the matter. I think those records were a good thing for Kendrick because he was able to show he was able to show like I could do this pop shit too if I really wanted. Pimp squeak pipe down, you ain't in no big three. Scissor got you wiped down, Travis got you wiped down, Savage got you wiped down. In the first line, again, because of his height, Drake calls Kendrick a pip squeak, but also because Drake is a far bigger artist. He then goes on to address Kendrick's recent claims regarding the big three. Motherfuck the big three, nigga, it's just big me, nigga, bum. Drake points out that Kendrick is nowhere close to the big three, as SZA, Travis Scott, and 21 Savage all outsold Kendrick on their last albums. However, there's even more depth to the line when we look at the fact that Drake has had a number one record himself with all three of those artists. What's interesting to me is the fact that Drake doesn't mention J. Cole. What the fuck is this a 20v1 nigga? What's a prince to a king? He a son nigga. Now this is exactly what makes a good diss track. As we've seen a few times already, Drake is directly rebuttaling Kendrick's best shots from like that. Nigga Prince outlived my jack, nigga bum. So in Kendrick's line, he's saying that Prince, who passed away in 2016, outlived Michael Jackson, who passed away in 2009, implying that Drake's music will not stand the test of time. Drake takes the opportunity to perfectly flip this narrative by stating that like MJ, who was the king of pop, a prince is just a son to a king. At face value, this is already a great response, but when you realize that Michael Jackson's son is also named Prince, it adds a whole other layer. It's a very calculated line. Like, people have been counting this guy out, but he's really good at this shit, guys. He, he is. Get more love in a city that you find, nigga. Metro, shut your whole ass up and make some drums, nigga. The first line is extremely clear, where Drake points out that he's a far bigger draw in Kendrick's own city and that he gets more love. Drake then turns his sights on Metro Boomin and gives us one of the funniest lines on the track, telling the producer to shut up and get back to making beats. However, the sunning doesn't stop there as Metro allegedly isn't the super producer like the industry suggests. Allegedly? Word in the production streets is that Metro, he's just the drum guy. For all that, like, super producer shit, my boy ain't the best with the melodies. That's what they've been saying. I don't know. That's what they've been saying. Every other line on this diss has multiple meanings. Yeah, I'm the sixth guy. I'm the front runner. Y'all nigga manager was Chuz little blunt runner. Drake then switches ops again and hones in on the weekend who seems to surface any time that Drake's slander is ongoing. Drake starts off by claiming that he's the sixth god, he's the king of Toronto, which is the city that The Weeknd reps. The clowning then continues as Drake makes claims that The Weeknd's manager Cash used to work for Drake's man Chubbs as a blunt roller. He's basically saying that the guy was like a lackey, like a, like a, a servant, a personal assistant. Clean a six and you boys ain't even come from it. And when you boys got rich, you had to run from it. Drake proceeds to take shots at members of the weekend's management team, pointing out that they rep Toronto when they aren't even from there, which would evidently be true, as the co-founder is originally from Iran and the CEO is from Lebanon. Drake then continues to say that as soon as these guys got their hands on some money, they bounced. The Weeknd lives in LA, Cash XO lives in LA, and Sal lives in LA. 
cash blowing, able bread out here tricking. Trickin'? Shit we do for bitches, he doing for niggas. Jets, whips, chains, wicked, wicked, wicked. Spinning like you trying to fuck, boy, you tripping, boy, you tripping. Drake continues to clown the weekend's manager, Cash. It's alleged that over the years, Cash would gift rappers jewelry, flights, cars, and all kinds of luxury shit. For example, here is an iced out ring that he gifted to Travis Scott. And one month ago, he gifted this XO chain to Future. And that's exactly who Drake is also making fun of in this line. And he does that by referencing Future's flow from his track, Wicked. Wicked, Wicked, Wicked. Wicked, Wicked. I'm sick and tired of wearing this like knockoff Rolex. So if anyone, if anyone wants to buy me one, feel free. I'm just going to put that energy out there. Amazon, 80 bucks, baby. Drizzy Chippendale probably got your bitch in there. So again, I got to bring it back to this Tokyo girl as she was literally gifted some Chanel shoes, making the post the very next day after she attended the Drake concert. Drake also references the cartoon Chip and Dale, who were two chipmunks that helped everybody that needed help. Furthermore, Chip and Dale always fought with a character called Pluto, who they would always outwit. And as you know, Future also goes by the name Pluto. Rolling loud stage, I would turn. That was slick as hell. Shit'll probably change if it's being start to kiss and tear. Drake acknowledges the moment at Rolling Loud where Future and Metro played an early version of Like That for the crowd. People seem to think that this line is about Travis Scott, but they are wrong as this line is most definitely about Future. Drake is claiming that Future's shows might look a little different if his BM, aka Baby Mama, starts to kiss and tell. First and foremost, one of Future's baby mamas is Sierra, who had a track kiss and tell. However, when I looked into this further, I found that Future has eight children with eight different women, but due to the fact that Drake uses the initials BM, I've narrowed it down to this woman right here, Brittany Mealy. Now, Future has had a real rocky relationship with this baby mama in particular, including a recent court battle for child support, which she won. Now, Drake seems to be in contact with this woman, and it would appear that she has some career-altering dirt on Future that Drake now also knows about. Hugs and kisses, man, don't tell me about no switches. I'll be rocking every fucking chain I own next visit. In the first line, Drake takes a shot at The weekend, calling him soft, as his XO label is sometimes interpreted as hugs and kisses. The line, of course, also acts as a rebuttal to Kendrick's line from Like That, where he's talking about switches, and Drake is basically claiming that Kendrick's not built like that either. I'll be rocking every fucking chain I own next visit, ayy. Hey. I'll be with some bodyguards like Whitney. Again, Drake is responding directly to Kendrick's claims on Like That, where he name-dropped his bodyguard 2Ts and claimed that he would snatch Drake's chain. Drake's coming with that energy, man. Like, he's, he's coming, he's rocking every fucking chain next visit. That's hard. However, it is really the second line that got a lot of people talking. First and foremost, Drake claims that he's with some bodyguards like Whitney, which is an ode to the movie The Bodyguard, starring Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner. This movie is about a bodyguard that is hired to protect Whitney, and they end up falling in love. To further complicate this whole thing, Kendrick's wife's name is also Whitney, which could mean that she slept with her bodyguard. When Drake really wants to put emphasis on something, something that I noticed over the years, is he, he tends to drag out his words. We saw the same thing with Duppy Freestyle when it came to Pusha's wife. And just think about it. Like, if this is actually true, and Kendrick hired a man with his own money to protect his wife, Whitney, like the movie The Bodyguard, and she really was fucking around on him, like that... This line is even more fucking crazy, if, if this is true. And I'm so committed to this whole thing that I literally watched the entire movie last night with my girl. And while it didn't do much for me, it made me remember that Drake has mentioned this movie before. 
bodyguards don't look like Kevin Costner, you tweaking. When we look at just how calculated Drake is, I don't believe for one second that Drake is mentioning this movie again on one of his most scathing diss records of his entire career. Just pulled up to Whitney Houston, Texas for the evening. I think this is a true subliminal in the sense that we don't get it, but Kendrick does. Even Pusha T admitted that he felt like Drake was exceptional at these types of subs. You know, uh, uh, lines here and there that I feel like, and he's really good at that. Like, He's great at that. Great at that. So yeah. He brought a line that, like, he's him and Hov under he's, the radar. And he's can, one of know. the best with the sub. Yeah. Look, guys, where there's smoke, there's fire. Kendrick has had plenty of issues with his wife, and I'm standing on this one. Drake knows something. Top say, drop your little midget ass, better fuck it. Hey, better drop and give me 50. Hey, drop and give me 50. As Drake continues to bring up this 50% narrative, he's not speaking in the past tense, and he's making it seem like even today, Top Dog still has his hands in Kendrick's pockets. It's very interesting. Something else to mention about this little hook is that Drake is paying homage to Mike Jones, Drop and Give Me 50. Now, beyond paying homage, you can best believe there's a reason why he selected this record. I just can't figure it out. Niggas really got me out here talking like I'm 50. Niggas really got me out here rapping what I'm living. Coming off the iconic Woo Kid drop, Drake claims that he's attacking the situation like 50 Cent. Bear in mind, 50 does indeed have a history of dissing a bunch of rappers on a single record. And when he says, like, you got me rapping what I'm living, he's just meaning, like, I'm coming with facts. Like, I'm giving him receipts. I really did give you your first number one. You really did leave Toronto. Your album really did flop and came five years. I really am way richer than you. I really am way bigger than you. I really do have all the most number ones. He's rapping what he's living. I might take your latest girl a couple like on Ricky. Can't believe he jumping in this nigga turning 50. Every song that made it on a chart he got from Jizzy. Spend that little check, you gotta stay about my business. In the first line, Drake says cuff her like I'm Ricky, clowning Ross for being a correctional officer back in the day. Now, the fact that he also calls him Ricky is an ode to 50 Cent's hilarious skits about Rick Ross. Officer Ricky? Damn, Rick. Now, the leaked version had a line that I, I did want to point out. Worry about whatever going on with you and, oh, hey. So he leaves out the last line, but we can fill in the blanks. He's talking about Diddy. And Rick Ross does have some allegations about connections to Diddy. As I was doing the edit, I thought of something else, too. When Drake says, cuff her like I'm Ricky, that could actually be a reference to the Diddy shit, too. Like these freaky ass party parties, like with the cuffs and shit, you know what I mean? Nigga, shout out to the hooper that be busting out the gritty. We know why you mad, nigga, I ain't even tripping. All that little heartbroken Twitter shit for bitches. This line is directed at John ja Morant, who is known for doing a dance called the gritty. When Metro posted a tweet that said, once you pick a side, stay there, Ja seemingly sided with him by retweeting, stay on that side. When Drake says we all know why you're mad, he's likely referring to how he was spotted on a date with Brooklyn Nicole and she is Ja Moran's ex. When you think about it, man, like the way it seems right now, Drake's got most of these dudes shook over pussy. Really, like not all of them, but a lot of them. And that fucking song y'all got to not start the beef with us. This shit being brewing in a pot now, heating up. Pretty self-explanatory. I told you guys this four months ago, and a lot of you guys said I was crazy. I don't care what Cole think that dot shit was weak as fuck. Champagne tripping, he is not fucking easing up. And while Drake doesn't really say anything bad about J. Cole, he does kind of stunt on him a little bit by just showing that he's not afraid to do this shit. This is further solidified when Drake claims that he has no intentions of easing up possibly alluding to Cole's apology for his diss. Everyone was basically claiming that J. Cole was the only person capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kendrick, and he bowed out. I feel like Drake was very disappointed with J. Cole, and not including him in the big three line from earlier was telling. You ain't in no big three. Scissor got you wiped down. Travis got you wiped down. Savage got you wiped down. 
And first person shooter is where it all started. J. Cole's the one that said the big three. So you think that Drake would take the opportunity as a slam dunk to throw Cole's name in there, but he doesn't. Nigga call it top to see a top want a piece of the top want a piece of the top want a piece of the now nah, pussy now you on your own when you speaking up. So Kendrick announced his departure from TDE back in 2021 and after Mr. Morell, he was supposedly a free man. Drake clowns Kendrick and claims that as a result of this beef, he's going to be calling Anthony Top Dog to try and piece things up. Now, a lot of people seem to think that Kendrick is buddy-buddy with the guys over at TDE, but there has been rumors that this is not the case. I did watch a video a while back from a creator called Geek About It, and he put together a pretty compelling narrative. So big shout out to that guy. I'm going to leave a link to his video in the description. And he's got like 16,000 subs, so run the subs up for him. He, he, he's he got a good channel. You don't roll deep to this, he's not fucking deep enough. This is one of my favorite lines on the track. It's just such a hard narrative flip, given the fact that all the biggest artists in the game are teaming up on Drake, and he's still saying, sorry, that's still not enough. Numbers wise, I'm out of here, you're not fucking creeping up. Money wise, I'm out of here, you're not fucking sneaking up. Corn by your show money, merch money, feed us. When Drake finds these little pockets like this, like it just reminds me so much of Jay-Z. Like your show money is merch money to us. Like it's just that braggadocious money talk, numbers talk. Like what are we doing? What are you talking about? I'm gonna let you niggas work it out because I've seen enough. This ain't even everything I know don't wait to demon up. This ain't even everything I know don't wait to demon up. This is by far the most confident Drake that we have ever seen going into a battle. Now, we don't know what Drake knows, but I'm going to call it right now. He's about to blow the fucking doors off this thing. This one's different for Drake. He's, he's coming in different. Drake then switches it up and goes into a far more melodic flow. Drake is literally begging Kendrick to drop, which honestly tells me even more that he's got something crazy in the tuck. Regardless of what you hear online, this is a very, very solid diss record from Drake. Drake is the one that took the plunge here. He's the first one to come with this type of energy. He came reciting facts. He rebuttaled every line that anyone said about him. And while he did get personal in this record, he did not reveal his whole hand. Drake has left us wondering what else he has in the tuck. This is a very solid record. And you guys are always trying to pinpoint, like, what team I'm on. Like, he's he's a Kendrick Glazer. He's Team Kendrick. And now, because of this video, because I'm talking favorably about Drake, you guys are going to call me a Drake Glazer. I'm not on anyone's team. Like, just because I'm, I'm complimenting Drake for what he did in his diss, I'm just speaking facts about his diss. It's a great record. But when it comes to a team, I don't have a team. I'm Team Hip Hop. When Kendrick drops his diss... Whenever that, whenever that is, I'm going to come in with just as much energy for that video. I love this shit. I, I'm team hip hop. There is no picking sides. What's the dirt is so dope, bro. He kills it, right? His he Kendrick is so and, fire. And Drake, Hold it, bro. Shoot. That shit is so hard, dog. Run it back. And shout out to my dude, What's the Dirt, because I do like him. Mm -hmm. I do. Oh, yes, he's dope. What's the Dirt? Shout out to that person. Uh, the homie looked like he did, he did a good job. I saw that clip on YouTube. The guy did a good job. He did. He did a good job with that. That's crazy. This guy's the Nostradamus of rap. Fresh out the club, on my way back to the mansion. You know where I'm from, you don't never gotta ask us. 